Epstein is best known as the editor of the American Scholar from 1975 until 1997, as an accomplished writer of literary criticism, short stories, and personal essays. He was born in Chicago on January 9, 1937, as part of a Jewish family. He was educated at Nicholas Sen High School in Chicago's North Side. After briefly attending the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Epstein went to the University of Chicago, from which he received a bachelor's in 1959. He was a lecturer at Northwestern University from 1974 to 2002. He is a contributing editor at the Weekly Standard and a longtime contributor of essays and short stories to the New Criterion and Commentary. In his 20s, he served in the U.S. Army in Texas and Arkansas in which he claims, I have never felt more American than when I was in the Army. He served in the army from 1958 to 1960 and was, in other words, a Cold War soldier, and never for a moment in danger. Much of his time in the military, he worked on the Post newspaper at Fort Hood in Texas and later as a clerk typing up physicals in a recruiting station in Little Rock, Arkansas, in which he describes as excruciatingly boring. Yet he is grateful for having served. Doing so took him out of his own social class and gave him a vivid sense of the social breadth of his country. After a short time in the army, he worked at a low-paying job on a political magazine in New York City, but soon returned to Chicago where during the mid-1960s and early 1970s, he served as a senior editor for the Encyclopedia Britannica. He was the son of Maurice and Barbara. Epstein's father was a salesman who, unlike the tragic figure of Arthur Miller's Willie Loman, managed to prosper. He has very fond memories of a father who worked hard in America and who actually succeeded. Epstein has been married twice to Joanne Elizabeth Bales, whom he married in 1960 and divorced in 1970, and by whom he had two sons. Since 1976, he has been married to Barbara Mayer. During his freelance phase, Epstein gained enough knowledge of marital discord for his first marriage to end in divorce, which prompted him to write his first book, Divorced in America, Marriage in the Age of Possibility, in 1974. Epstein focuses on how and why marriage became such a struggling institution. He looks at the legal proceedings of a divorce and talks about the effect divorce has on individuals involved. Chicago, along with suburb Evanston, Illinois, is Epstein's familiar ground, and while he may do times of travel to give lectures, he has always returned to his roots. Evanston is, as he words it, convenient. For years, many have regarded Epstein as courageous for taking strong, often unpopular positions. Joseph Epstein is a self-described language snob, someone who believes that people should use words with clarity and precision, but often do not. Taken together, Epstein's essay make it clear that he enjoys traveling against the cultural grain, not only because playing the cynic gives his essays an in-your-face, edgy flavor, but also because being a persuasive tastemaker is what literary cultural clerics at their best do. Some would argue that Epstein preaches to the already converted, and that his free-thinking posture, however much drenched in wit and learning, produces more exasperation than agreement. He would not be surprised to learn that some readers give up midway through one of his criticisms. He writes, as he once said in an interview, for himself and for strangers who might happen to share my interest. Over some 40 years at the writing desk, a significant number of these strangers have discovered that Epstein has put into carefully chiseled words precisely what they had in fact been thinking for some time. 
It can definitely be said that more collections of short essays, short fiction, and criticism will most surely follow. He is a very prolific writer. His essay, Who Killed Poetry, was published in Commentary in 1988. Epstein begins by insisting that he does not dislike poetry. He says, I was taught that poetry was itself an exalted thing. He admits his quasi-religious language and asserts that it was during the 1950s that poetry last had this religious aura. Epstein's essay itself compares poetry to a sickly patient which so many poets, critics, editors, small press publishers, and creative writing programs have been struggling to keep alive. If survival is genuinely at stake, it won't do to ignore the symptoms. Epstein had conjectured that the generations of poets between W.B. Yeats and W.H. Auden produced an impressive body of poetry that those succeeding failed to keep up with. The heart of Epstein's argument is this, whereas one tended to think of the modernist poet as an artist, even if he worked in a bank in London, or at an insurance company at Hatford, or in a physician's office in Rutherford, New Jersey, one tends to think of the contemporary poet as a professional, a poetry professional. He says that the poets who come out of this atmosphere are neither wholly academics nor wholly artists. As such, they perform neither function very well. Epstein argues that poetry is being overproduced and is starting to lose its importance, where he says there have been contemporary poets I have much admired, but none has been able to plant language in my head the way that poets of an earlier generation could. Not a poet, Epstein holds an idealized view of poetry's literary standing where he says, poetry is like caviar, an acquired taste, and not for most people, not even for some highly intelligent people. And I happen to believe that selling poetry as if it were hot dogs demeans it. To sum everything up, Epstein regretfully concludes that poetry has become an academic exercise written by poetry professionals for other poetry professionals as a result of which it has lost its touch with both a real audience or live subject matter. Contemplating the occupants of hundreds of universities offering creative writing courses, Epstein describes the resulting poetic clarity by saying that many of these men and women go from being students in one writing program to being teachers in another, without their feet, metrical or anatomical, having touched the floor. By reading Epstein's essay, Many can say that American poetry now belongs to a subculture, no longer part of the mainstream of artistic and intellectual life. It has become sort of like a specialized occupation of a relatively small and isolated group. Therefore, Joseph Epstein focuses on what he sees as a qualitative decline in American poetry since the modernist generation of Pound, Eliot, Stevens, Crane, Williams, Moore, Cummings, and Auden. These poets, Epstein claims, were true artists, whatever their actual profession happened to be. Their work was memorable, and once read, it was never quite forgotten. Contemporary poets, on the other hand, are professional without being imaginative, talented, or even particularly competent. Furthermore, Epstein also identifies another generic problem which is an overemphasis on the short lyric as a focal point of contemporary poetry. While a good deal of recent work has been done in other poetic forms, it is clearly the personal post-romantic lyric that continues to receive the most attention in the mainstream poetic community, and that it remains the basis of workshop practice in the vast majority of creative writing programs. Furthermore, according to Epstein, Poets don't write what people want to read, and even though more and more work is being produced with creative writing programs ever in the ascendant, poetry in America has been driven into what he calls a dark corner.
for the analysis, I will focus on Epstein's views on the role universities and creative writing courses play in the death of poetry. Epstein says that writing programs support artists for who they are and not for what they do. Associated writing programs and its many colleges and universities have created the largest system of literary patronage the world has ever seen. Therefore, this begs the question, is the writing supported by these programs any good? Here is where Epstein questions whether or not these writing programs are actually supporting something that is worth supporting. Witness to the greatest single change in literary life in this country and the gradual usurpation of literature by the university, Epstein seems almost wistful and longing for a former day when a majority of writers did not work in a university and contemporary writers were not taught as part of the curriculum. This shows up repeatedly in his writing as a symptom of degeneracy of the academic system. Also, Epstein points out that the great majority of poets today live in an atmosphere almost entirely academic, but it is academic with a difference, not the world of science and scholarship, but that of the creative writing program and the writing workshop. Epstein points out that poets who come out of this atmosphere publish chiefly in journals sheltered by universities. They fly around the country giving readings and workshops at other colleges and universities. To this, Epstein says, well, it's a living. This begs to question what sent so many poets into the universities. Epstein says that the inability to make a living through writing alone is what sent them there. He says, where in our time they are rather dim figures permitted to work on their craft, not so much an ornament to the culture as something closer to a parasite upon it, living from grant to grant, workshop to workshop, involved in an intense relationship with the self, that all-consuming locust of our age which chomps up all before it. Epstein also argues that creative writing programs are not only producing more people who think of themselves as poets than this or any other country needs, but through the encouraging the somewhat therapeutic atmosphere of the workshop, are generally lowering the high standard of work, which is poetry's only serious claim on anyone's attention. Epstein also blames the decline of poetry by saying that it has gone off in the direction of the lyric. Epstein says that by taking up the lyric as its chief form, contemporary poetry has seriously delimited itself. He explains that it thereby gives away much that has always made literature an activity of primary significance. It gives away the power to tell stories, to report on how people live and have lived, to struggle for those larger truths about life, the discovery of which is a final justification for reading. Epstein writes that the center of literary life today is in the university which is to say that the center of literary life does not exist except in an attenuated and abstract form. It can be said that however much contemporary poetry may be honored, it is outside a very small circle, scarcely read. He emphasizes on the fact that contemporary poetry is no longer a part of the regular intellectual diet. People of general intellectual interest who feel that they ought to read uh, poetry no longer feel the same compunction about contemporary poetry. Poetry has been shifted off center state. Based on everything that is written on his essay, readers can definitely say that Joseph F. Stein is not really a fan of contemporary literature. He says that he finds himself buying lots of contemporary books, but somehow they just don't have the same quality. He says that literature used to be taken more seriously and was written out of greater seriousness than it is now. One can say that it is probably due to the fact that literature has been lowered in standard. In the old days, Oxford used to teach nothing beyond Wordsworth. The assumption was that you didn't have to teach the good contemporary novelists and critics because if you were interested in literature, you were going to read them on your own time. That assumption really doesn't hold up anymore. It may be because there are too many forms of competing intellectual entertainment such as movies and television and all of that. According to Epstein, it is safe to say that poetry flourishes in the academic. Therefore, Epstein asserts that poetry is vastly overproduced by men and women who are licensed to write it by degree, if not necessarily by talent or spirit. Epstein also connects language to the death of poetry. He is one of the few writers who consciously 
links the way language is used by our best authors in the more general state of American culture. Where he says, where did all that elegant, potent, lovely language go, or more precisely, where went the power to create such language? F. Side acknowledges the main problem by saying that contemporary poetry in the United States flourishes in a vacuum. He says that today there are more than 250 universities with creative writing programs, and all of these have a poetry component. Which means that they do not only train aspiring poets, but they hire men and women who have published poetry to teach them. It has been over 28 years since he published Who Killed Poetry and Commentary, but it still ignites an explosion of criticism. Perhaps more interesting that his essay itself is a reaction to it by various members of the poetic community. Poetry seems as either dead or very alive, and this difference causes a rift in American literary culture. In two consecutive issues after its publication, the APW Chronicle ran a special symposium devoted to Epstein's essay, including both a reprint of the essay itself and responses by some 30 poets, editors, and administrators. These ranged from extremely negative assessments to favorable reviews by those who agreed wholly or in part with Epstein's position. Therefore, Epstein's writing is provocative and has frequently met with a lot of controversy. Epstein's article provoked a predictably outraged set of responses from the poets invited to reply. Most of the respondents asserted the health and quality of the contemporary poetic product, and a lot of them blamed the audience for its failure to give contemporary poetry the serious attention it deserves. Epstein concludes his essay by saying, one gets a darting glint of it every once in a while in the work of the better contemporary poets. But to pretend that the meaty and delectable bird freely walks the land isn't going to get him out of hiding. Not soon, and maybe not ever. This means that although there is some poetry worth reading, it doesn't change the fact that it is still disappearing.